Thank you. Okay, so this review session is going to be focused on getting you guys prepared for the final exam. So as you can see on the board, I just kind of wrote a little bit of a layout as to um, what's going to be on the final, or I should say the layout of the final. So we do have 120 questions. Um, keep in mind the final exam is cumulative for the entire course. Um, it will be at 150 points. Um, probably the highest points, you know, out of any exam, obviously, that we've had. Um, we do have multiple choice. Some select all of the applied questions. So just basically the same layout that we have for our normally, uh, normally that we have for our quizzes and um, our midterm exam. Okay, so it's not a totally different layout. Um, and we will have some basic anatomy and physiology questions. Okay, so um, I'm just going to stop here for a second and actually just go into a little more detail. Number one, a lot of times people would like to know, are we going to have um, repeat questions on the exam? So yes, it is a possibility that you will have, or I shouldn't say a possibility, but you will have repeat questions on your final exam from previous uh, test questions. Um, however, I do encourage students to study everything because I also have in my question bank questions that you have not received before. Okay, so you do have a combination of things. Uh, when it comes to anatomy and physiology, there are some areas that um, we did go into just basic anatomy and physiology with. Um, I do like to include anatomy and physiology questions on a patho final, and the reason why is because sometimes I notice students do not remember basic anatomy, which is so important moving forward into nursing. Okay. Um, when you get into physical assessment or med surge or whatever classes that you're taking, if you don't know, you know, the lobes of the lung or where they are in certain areas or let's say just body regions or what, um, you know, an eosinophil does, okay, things like that are extremely important that you need to know from here, general education, moving on into nursing, okay, because they're expecting you guys to know that information already. So saying that, for anatomy and physiology, uh, what I actually like to focus on is definitely blood and cardiovascular. So one thing I'm gonna tell you is to make sure you please review, um, and I did include some of this information in chapter, which one had the anemias? Was it 13, 14? Whichever chapter had the anemias. I did include some basic anatomy and physiology within that PowerPoint. So please make sure you go over everything that you should know as far as anatomy and physiology of a red blood cell, okay? We should know what red blood cells are doing, how long they last in the bloodstream, what happens when they die off, the turnover rate, that, that whole thing, okay? Um, that's so important, okay? Definitely moving forward. I would also suggest um, taking a look at white blood cells and knowing the names and knowing their functions as well. Um, one thing that you guys know that you'll be doing is looking at labs, okay, um, pretty much every patient or every other patient, okay. So looking at labs, yes, is nice, and looking at what's high, what's low, what's going on, but if you don't know the normal function of that red blood cell, there's no point in looking at a CBC with differential if you have no idea what a monocyte does, if you have no idea what a neutrophil does, okay. So we want to make sure we know the functions of those cells. Another thing when it gets to cardiac uh, or cardiovascular anatomy and physiology, it is important to make sure you know the flow of blood in and out of the heart. Um, I know I spoke about that before many times. This information directly correlates with congestive heart failure. Okay, so we have that information within chapter 19. Just in case, I would also review, and I think there's some information in your textbook with this or maybe in the PowerPoint, I would also review cardiac cycle. And in a sense where um, we should know cardiac cycle and what the PQRST intervals are or how it correlates to cardiac cycle basically. Another thing with anatomy and physiology, um, we did cover the basic um, blood pressure regulation in chapter 16. So we have, I think, the first half of the PowerPoint in chapter 16 focused on that. So I would definitely go over that. You should know how the body normally regulates blood pressure. 
In particular, we should be able to understand what the purpose of a stroke volume does, what's the purpose of systemic vascular resistance, what's the purpose of cardiac output and how that correlates to heart rate and the stroke volume. We should know systolic, diastolic, how we get to those numbers or those, those readings, okay? So we should be able to know that information and how the body normally regulates blood pressure, okay? The other piece to how the body normally uh, regulates blood pressure um, is understanding how the renal system is involved, okay? Which is that whole process of the renin angiotensin aldosterone pathway. I would definitely pay attention to that. Um, and also included in that, we went over in the video, or I should say in the PowerPoint, how hypertensive medications, okay, are part of that process as well. And so we also went into detail short-term and long-term regulation, okay. So even though that information in 16 sounds like, okay, well, yeah, that's part of hypertension, but that's really basic anatomy physiology, okay, of blood pressure regulation. So I would say pay close attention to that. I, I can guarantee you there's going to be some questions with that information. Um, moving forward out of cardiac, um, we had the respiratory system and we didn't get into a lot of A and P with this, but one thing that I would say is um, make sure you know the basic anatomical parts of the respiratory system and in particular making sure you know what the function of the alveoli is for. Um, that's extremely important because the alveoli is the main structure for um, basically gas exchange, okay? Um, every other structure in the airway is kind of just more for air distribution, okay? But where we talk about actual gas being exchanged and getting into the bloodstream and that whole process, um, alveoli is very important for that. I would also know the importance of surfactant in regards to alveoli because we know that there was a couple of conditions that led to decreased surfactant and the alveoli collapsing, okay, causing respiratory conditions, um, in particular things like ARDS, IRDS, and also emphysema as well, okay, causing issues with surfactant and the alveoli collapsing. So we should definitely know the, the purpose of surfactant and what it does. Um, <clears throat> Outside of respiratory, um, we have renal, then I'll get to reproductive. So for renal, um, trying to see here. Again, we didn't really get into a lot of detail with anatomy here. Um, one thing I would say is just make sure you know the anatomical structures of the renal system, you know, as far as kidneys, ureters, um, urinary bladder, urethra. Um, it's also important to know um, not only just the structures, but their locations um, in regards to the body. And the reason why I say that is because um, I think that can help you maybe on some test questions where you may get a little confused with certain things. So the kidneys are retroperitoneal, okay? Um, they're the only structure in the renal system that really sits kind of behind, okay? Everything else, the ureters do come forward anteriorly, and then the urinary bladder is anterior as well as the urethra. So when it comes to, uh, let's say for example, we went over renal calculi, okay? And when patients do have renal calculi and understanding how it's formed, okay, knowing that they can have back pain or flank pain, but then it also will travel forward, okay, because of the anatomy. So knowing the anatomy is very important, I would say, with the renal system. Um, The other thing too, and I think I have this as one of the practice questions with um, what I have this week. You should know the location of the kidney as in relation to the vertebral level, and I think that was in the PowerPoint as well. So between 10, T10 excuse me, and L1, uh, the kidneys do lie in that region. Very important to know why, because you know, you guys should know where to go when you're doing an assessment on a patient, okay? And knowing, okay, well, if you have to do a kidney punch test or whatever, you'll know to go in that area, okay? So it's between T10 and L1. Um, what else? I think 
that was about it for like anatomy and biology of the kidneys. Okay. Um, reproductive systems. So with the reproductive systems, um, just kind of reviewing and knowing basic anatomy again. So just knowing what structures are part of obviously male and female reproductive uh, systems. I would even go as far as knowing which organs secrete which hormones because this information comes up not only in reproductive but I want to say it also comes up in chapter two as well. So um, knowing that you know testosterone is being released by the testes and you know that uh, the ovaries help with the secretion of estrogen and Gesturone is more from the uterine and you know just kind of knowing you know what's happening with those hormones and, and not only where the hormones are being secreted from but also knowing um, what the hormones are actually doing their function so again even if you it you can have test questions that can go one or two ways here even if you have a test question that's directly related or indirectly related okay you should know this information because if it's directly related, it'll say, okay, well, you know, which organ secretes, you know, estrogen or testosterone or whatever. But then let's say if you have a question about ovarian cysts, and we know that there's different types of ovarian cysts depending on if there's um, estrogen related, progesterone related, okay. So we should be able to kind of uh, figure that part out, okay. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, GI. GI, as far as anatomy and physiology, not too much going on here. Um, I would say just knowing basic anatomy and just knowing basic function. Now that's important uh, because sometimes I think people do tend to forget the normal function as well of these structures, okay? So something as simple as understanding that the stomach is the site for digestion Okay, because this is where really a lot of digestion takes place because of the things that are secreted, okay, that helps break down food. And we know that the small intestines is a major site for absorption, okay, and um, once we get to the large intestines and rectum, we're, you know, getting ready for evacuation of waste at that point. Um, even something as simple as liver and gallbladder, okay? The liver actually uh, makes bile, okay? The gallbladder will store it, okay? And not only just the liver making bile, but understanding that the liver has so many different functions, okay? The liver makes bile, and let me just take a moment just so we can review this. What is the purpose of the liver making bile for? Fat. Very good to emulsify fats. Okay, so when we talk about fat metabolism that occurs in the body, the liver is definitely one of the main organs for this. Okay, what are some other functions of the liver that we remember from anatomy? Liver has a lot of functions. And the reason why I'm stressing this is because you know, it can, this correlates to a lot of different diseases that patients encounter. Detox. Very good. This is our main detoxification organ. Okay. So, as I said before, one of the videos, go to happy hour, get too happy. Okay. What happens is that any alcohol that you ingest, okay, the liver will actually take that toxin and detoxify, okay, um, that toxin that you just ingested. Why? Because we need to make sure your blood is clear, clean, or just clean, but in a sense where it has the proper pH levels, okay, so we don't have things too acidic. Um, because anytime you have toxins, it actually makes your, the internal organs more acidic, okay, so it puts your body in a state of an acidic environment. But your liver actually will kind of cleanse that, okay, so we're not in an acidic state. Um, the liver, don't forget, also makes coagulation factors. Um, we had a whole chapter about people having blood clotting issues, okay? And so um, some people do 
have situations where they have congenital disorders where they're missing certain factors and things like that. Um, the liver actually makes a lot of coagulation factors, okay? And the liver also is a major storage for vitamins as well. Okay, so most of our vitamins and nutrients do get stored in the liver. That, that's not, that's with class. Okay. Um, most of the vitamins and nutrients are um, used to actually get stored in the liver. Um, even when we talk about vitamin K, okay, vitamin K we know is very important as well to help make coagulation factors. And so that's also another storage that's part of the liver as well, okay. So if you have a patient in the future that has liver conditions, you want to think about all the possible secondary conditions that can fall under the situation, okay. So they can have issues with blood clotting, they can have issues maybe detoxifying or fat metabolism, so therefore they can lead to fatty liver and you know things like that, okay. So the basic anatomy stuff is so important because if a patient has, this is a normal function, and if they have any kind of disease process and they're out of normal, then you know what's gonna happen, okay. And then your job as nurses is to hopefully reverse that, okay. Now, uh, 40, what was 41? Oh, 41 was about diabetes mellitus and pancreas. Uh, what do we need to know about that? I don't really have many anatomy physiology questions directly related to the pancreas, but what I would say is this. Just make sure you know the function of the alpha beta cells, okay? Um, you know, the pancreas, going back to anatomy, has a number of different cells and different functions. I want to say it's alpha, beta, and delta cells, okay? Um, we'll just leave it there, okay? Um, and then the rest of the chapters here, 44, 51, and 52, I really don't have a lot of directly related anatomy and physiology questions with this information with brain and muscle skeletal disorders. Um, again, the only thing I would say is just making sure you know just basic anatomy of it. Um, so just knowing um, what's part of the nervous system, okay, which I think is, you know, fairly easy for us to remember. Um, as far as the muscle, uh, muscle skeletal system, um, just kind of knowing, I'm trying to think what directly correlated questions I have with this. Just knowing, I don't even know. <laughs> um, because I really don't have a lot of anatomy and physiology questions, you know, with that information. Um, and I, I feel that the topics are kind of straightforward anyway when it comes to that. Okay, so that's my spiel on anatomy and physiology. Okay, so we have an idea as to what you should focus on. Okay, um, because sometimes when I put anatomy and physiology, people are like, oh my gosh, do I need to review everything? No, you don't need to review everything, but there are certain things that I do want you to focus on. So definitely blood, cardiac, and just kind of knowing basic anatomical parts and functions from there, okay? Um, so as far as your textbook, there were a few things that were in the textbook I wanted you guys to focus on, so a few tables. Uh, from chapter seven, we focused on cancers with this chapter. So. Table 7.1 and 7.2, uh, what I would say with this is um, 7.1 gives us a table with characteristics of benign and malignant tumors. Um, it does have some extra information, I believe, that's different than what's in your PowerPoint, so you can take that information and just add it to your notes, okay? Um, I think by now we all kind of know the characteristics between benign and malignant tumors, so we should be easily able to identify that. Um, you could very well have a test question about a cancer, even if we haven't gone heavily you know, into that cancer and in, into detail, but just based off of the information that I give you in a test question, you should be able to figure out if it's benign or malignant. You know? So I'll give you information like characteristics, you know? so if it's mobile or if it's, um, you know, has, has it spread or if it's local or you know, things like that, okay? Um, 7.2 is just a chart that goes over all the different cancers, okay, uh, the names of cancers. I don't need you to memorize each and every item there, um, but I would say just take a look at it so you know how to use ulma, carcinoma, sarcoma, okay, and so we know how to use that. And again, that, can, that information can also be correlated within a question 
that I was explaining before about if I have a question on a certain cancer and I say, well, the patient has adenocarcinoma, okay, and it has now, you know, uh, metastasized to this region. So just based off of that information, you should be able to figure out that it is malignant, okay? So, you know, just things like that. Um, just to clarify, in one of the previous videos, and as I was talking earlier with Johnson, I, I really do need to update my videos, and I've been saying that I, I really need to just sit my booty down and just <laughs> sit with the camera and just, up, you know, update my videos. But anyway, with the videos, um, one of the previous videos, I in the past, I told students to memorize tumor markers, okay? Um, I just want to clarify that I am not holding you responsible for memorizing the tumor markers in the textbook. Um, so if you watch one of the previous videos and it said memorize the tumor markers uh, from table 7.7 .7 or whatever it was, 7.6, um, for the top four cancers, I'm not holding you responsible for that, okay? So I just want to clarify that. Um, however, you should know the purpose of a tumor marker. Okay, so that information I will test you on. So tumor markers are something that we do uh, test and identify for patients that may have a particular cancer so we can figure out what cancer it is, okay? Um, so they can usually test the blood work or maybe biopsy or you know, whatever type of special testing. Um, and the tumor marker lets us know what type of cancer it is and also it kind of helps us figure out how you can manage that cancer, okay? So um, that information is important. Okay, and the tumor markers also come from the parent cancer, okay? So that information is very important to know. It comes from the primary of parent cancer. So if a patient has, let's say, prostate cancer and then it metastasize to the femur or the heart or wherever else it's going to metastasize, what will happen is that um, the body will always secrete the tumor marker for the primary cancer. Okay, so that way we can track tumor activity and know exactly what's happening. Okay. Now, moving on, box 20.1 is another kind of table that uh, focuses on the categories of shock. Um, I've had this information before in a previous quiz as well as I believe the midterm, so I'm telling you to make sure you go over this again, okay? Um, please make sure you memorize the four different categories of shock as well as the uh, types of shock that fall under those categories, okay? Um, why, it is very important to know because um, you guys, I'm quite sure we'll encounter shock. Um, so making sure you understand what happens when patients have distributive shock versus hemorrhagic, you know, things like that is, is very important. Okay. okay, so moving on to the chapters. Um, these are the chapters listed here that you should know for the final exam. So as I said, it is cumulative from everything that we've touched on. Um, you know, throughout this term. Just to confirm, I am not putting chapters 24 and 25 on the final exam. Okay, you guys did have that as a take home assignment. Um, I have my reasons for it. And I, I feel that number one, the video needs to be updated. I, I feel that, I don't know if everyone feels comfortable with the information. So anyway, long story short, I'm just gonna leave it out, okay, uh, for now. And then, you will definitely pick up on that again when you get into core, okay? One thing that I just also want to tell you, and, um, and uh, I said this to the other sections, because now that I have my own YouTube channel and I will be updating videos this term, okay, or this coming term as well for the new people for next term, um, I want you guys to subscribe if you have the opportunity because when you get into core, and let's say you're in med surge and you're like, oh my gosh, I need to review cardiac or whatever you need to review, you can always go back to my YouTube channel and just click on the videos and review what you need, okay? Because I will be updating, you know, more information, okay? All right, so saying that, chapters one, two, four, and seven actually took us through week one. Um, I feel that the first week we kind of had a good handle, okay, on that information. Um, chapter one focused on 
Um, just basic terminology with patho, knowing the definitions, examples. I think we're all pretty good with that information. Um, there were maybe a few topics that kind of overlap or kind of can seem a little confusing, like maybe sequela and or androgenic or something like that. Um, but I think we, you know, for the most part, have a good handle on those topics, okay? Um, chapter two focus on stress and how the body adapts to stress. So what I focused on with this chapter was making sure you guys know the term homeostasis, allostasis, um, making sure we understand what body systems are involved with the stress response. So, uh, and just to kind of backtrack, also knowing the different types of stressors, okay? So we have a lot of stress, okay, that can occur day to day. A lot of times we think of emotional stress. Yes, we go through that, okay? Family issues, boyfriend issues, okay, mm -hmm. whatever. So we have emotional stress, but it is important to understand too that your patients can also undergo physical and chemical stress too. So sometimes they can have certain medication history, okay, or quantity of medications that they're taking, okay, that can put them into a chemical stress. So anyway, the point of saying that is, the way the body's gonna respond to that stress is actually um, either kicking in definitely the nervous system, the endocrine system, okay? The nervous and endocrine system are definitely the top two systems that will respond to stress. And that's chemical, physical, or emotional, whatever kind of stress is going on. Those systems will definitely try to adapt, so to speak, to it, okay? Um, and what does that mean to you as a nurse? Well, what's gonna happen is you're gonna see different signs and symptoms in the patient as the body's trying to adapt, okay, to those stressors. Um, we also wanna include here the immune system as well, okay? So the immune system will also be involved with certain types of stress-related things. Now, uh, saying that in the PowerPoint for two, you should be able to go over um, the systems and all the things that are secreted. Okay, so because I, I will test you on that. I think I test I, I did that before, but I will test you on that again. So we should know all of the things that are secreted. Okay. Um, my suggestion as you're studying for the final is to maybe take like each body system, say nervous system, endocrine, and then immune. And then just like with each system, just write down like what is being secreted, okay? So that way it's easier to kind of memorize, okay? Uh, so you'll know what's secreted during the stress response. Because every single thing is not secreted during the stress response. So we just wanna know those things that are. Okay, God bless you. Thank you. Chapter four um, went into detail with cellular injury, okay? So the reason why we started off here is because anytime disease process occurs, it starts at a cellular level. So we had two forms of cell injury, reversible and irreversible. Um, and I told you guys this before, the best way to study for this is make two columns, okay? You want a category irreversible and a category for reversible. And then just write down the information under those categories. That's the best way to memorize this information, okay? Um, so with that, with uh, reversible, we have our items there. When it comes to irreversible, we have our items there. Um, I'm not gonna go through each and every item, but just to highlight a few things. Number one, I would highlight that you pay close attention to hydropic swelling and how we use megaly or how that correlates with megaly. <clears throat> Excuse me, the term megaly. I would also um, pay close attention to cellular adaptations because with cellular adaptations, um, it, I don't know if you guys noticed this, but some of those topics did come up again throughout the term, okay? So, you know, metaplasia or dysplasia, what have you. So those terms did come up again. So we do wanna know what's happening with atrophy, hypertrophy, hyperplasia, metaplasia, dysplasia, okay? And knowing dysplasia is irreversible and that whole thing. Um, 
And then the other thing that I would sort of highlight is understanding uh, necrosis and gangrene, okay? And, and also knowing the different types, okay? Because so, we did go over the different types. Okay. Uh, chapter seven. What did I say before? Know everything. <laughs> Yeah, chapter seven is one of those chapters where it's like, uh, I mean, obviously you need to know everything with everything, but um, chapter seven, there's really not much I can, uh, you know, honestly pinpoint here. Um, all of this information is extremely important because if you notice, a lot of this information did come up again when we talked about other cancers in previous, in, you know, some of the uh, chapters moving forward. Um, so. Just to kind of run down the list really quickly, we went over definitely benign malignant tumors, so understanding the characteristics there. We went over the names of cancers. Um, we went over understanding metastasis. Um, we went over how cancers are diagnosed. And going into detail with that, we went over tumor markers. Um, we went over the difference between uh, grading and staging. Okay, so when cancers are diagnosed, um, they do go through a grading and staging procedure. Um, we went over, and sometimes people tend to forget this section, and I'll, I'll definitely elaborate on this one a little. Um, a lot of times people forget how cancer affects the body and the signs and symptoms patients are going to have with it, because in the PowerPoint, it doesn't really come out and say, oh, these are the signs and symptoms of cancer. But what it does, it goes over the immune system and understanding what we call immune suppression or bone marrow suppression. So when you see that title, immune suppression or bone marrow suppression, that's basically your signs and symptoms there of what the patient's gonna have with cancer. So, um, or their clinical manifestation. So please make sure you review that because sometimes, I don't know, not everyone, but some people don't make the correlation um, when a patient has cancer, they're going to have bone marrow suppression, which means white blood cells decrease, red blood cells decrease, um, platelets decrease. What does that all mean? Well, now that's going to lead them into secondary conditions that correlate with what's going on. Okay. So they're going to have anemias. They're going to have issues clotting the blood. They're going to have infections. Okay. One of the major things, and I think we talked about this before with cancer patients, is that um, the infections can get a little out of control. Okay, so we do want to understand that that's part of it, that that's part of cancer, okay. Um, I know we talked about why there's hair loss and, and, and why there's bone marrow suppression, especially when it correlates to chemotherapy, okay, so I would go over that. And um, I think the very last thing was the warning signs for adults and children, and then also the um, treatments for cancer, okay? Like I said, which was pretty much everything in that PowerPoint, okay? So, um, yeah, cancer is something we need to know everything about, okay? Okay, so that took us through week one. So week two, we had chapter 10, 11, 13, 14, 15. So um, really quickly, chapter 10, I think we all have a good handle on this information. And this went into hypersensitivity disorders. So I tailored down this information from chapter 10 and just focus on this. And so with hypersensitivity disorders, um, understanding type one, two, three, and four, one thing that I would say is make sure you know the numbers as well as the actual name for the types um, because you don't know what you're gonna have as a test question. So you wanna make sure you know the full name. Um, with these types, you should definitely know the following, the cell involvement. We should also know the mechanism. We should also know the time frame of this situation occurring. And we should definitely know um, examples okay because i want to say 
most of your test questions with this information will most likely include some sort of example to with all the, with the everything else. Okay. Chapter eleven. We broke this information down into two sections here. So the first, um, I think, twelve slides focused on just basic things about leukemias and lymphomas. So understanding the meanings of the names. Um, understanding how it's diagnosed through blood work. Um, we went over some common signs and symptoms, um, what we're achieving or trying to achieve with treatment, okay, as far as like uh, complete remission and you know all those terms, okay. So the first 12 slides you should definitely focus on from the PowerPoint, okay, because it gave you like a lot of concrete information there. Um, and also in detail, we discussed um, how we look at myeloid cells versus lymphoid cells and how that correlates to how we, um, you know, diagnose like AML and ALL and things like that. So the cell involvement. So we, we did go into details with that. We also went into detail with acute versus chronic and what that means, okay, because there is a difference especially according to leukemias and lymphomas, different than the normal acute and chronic definition, okay? So, um, once we're done with that information, slides 13 on goes through all of the different cancers, okay, for leukemias and lymphomas. So remember, you guys have the option of looking at the PowerPoint or the spreadsheet that was provided for you or both, whichever works for you. Um, however, for memorizing, um, it is best to make sure you memorize each topic and as well as the hallmarks or things that stand out with that particular cancer because those are the things that will help you for test questions. Um, I do have the hallmarks actually color coded in the spreadsheet to make it easier. So when you're reading a test question with a leukemia and lymphoma, we shouldn't be focusing on the patient has fatigue or an anemia or something like that because those are common signs and symptoms with cancers. But we should focus on, okay, if it's attacking a particular cell or if they have a particular type of symptom that stands out, okay, that's just for that particular cancer, okay? And I think we're comfortable with that, okay? Chapter 13 focused on anemias. Um, with this chapter, the best way to, uh, I would say, study this chapter is to break it down into acute, not acute, sorry, <laughs> acquired and congenital disorders, okay? So we can have a category for acquired and a category for congenital. So there are some congenital anemias that do happen. So sometimes patients are born with certain conditions. There's a list of those that go into anything from sickle cell to, um, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency or whatever, okay. Then we have acquired. Um, top of the list for acquired we know is iron deficiency anemia, okay. And then there's others, okay. So if you can just make that list and remember as before I made these questions kind of straightforward, plain and simple. Because anemias are just plain and simple. It's just a matter of knowing what the patient is deficient in, okay. So the reason why they're lacking red blood cells is because they're deficient in something, okay? So if you know the title and know the deficiency, you should be fine, okay? Um, chapter 14, oh, oh, I'm sorry, let me go back to 13. 13 also had polycythemias, so we had three. So again, just know the three, three different types, what's happening. And know the examples of the three different types because I can very well see a test question being correlated to an example because there's different examples for the different types, okay? Um, chapter 14 focuses on, uh, what is it? Uh, blood coagulation disorders. So when patients have issues clotting the blood, so this is another chapter you can divide into two categories, acquired or congenital, okay? So when people have a congenital bleeding disorder, they're usually missing a certain factor, okay? 
So one, I can give you an example, which is they say the most common congenital bleeding disorder is hemophilia. Okay, so we should know everything about hemophilia. There are some others, okay, so you can put those on the list. And then when it comes to acquired, we have things that are more kind of like medication related, uh, trauma related, you know, things like that. So you can just put those on that list. Um, as you remember, I didn't have tons of questions with this information before. Um, just to make you aware, clinically, most bleeding disorders, and I even confirmed this with one of your nursing instructors, most bleeding disorders that you are like this that you'll see bleeding issues are going to be from a patient's more acquired like from their medication or from some underlying condition or something going on but um, not a whole lot of congenital bleeding disorders unless you're working you know in closely related to that field okay um, so that's that okay Chapter 15 focused on blood flow disorders. So there were very specific things that I wanted you guys to know with this chapter. Okay, so I'll just run down the list. Number one, I want you to understand the concepts of what happens with arterial blockage versus venous blockage. And I know we went over that in detail and uh, understanding what's happening when that blockage occurs. We should also understand the concept or the difference between a thrombus versus an embolism. Okay, we should also know uh, the following conditions. Aneurysm, Berger's disease, Raynaud's syndrome, DVT, varicose veins, and I'm also going to throw in here because it was in the PowerPoint, lymphedema. Okay. Um, these topics that I have given you are probably the most common blood flow disorders that you're going to encounter. Okay. Um, aneurysms are common, I'm quite sure we've heard of that. Um, DVT is quite common, I'm quite sure we've heard of that as well. Okay. Varicose veins, you might have some right now in your legs. Okay. So these are common blood flow disorders, okay? So we do wanna know everything that was provided for you, okay, about this. Okay, um, so that was that for week two. Okay. Week three, we had 16, 18, 19, and 20, okay? Uh, before I get into the different um, topics here, if you do need an anatomy and physiology review, for your cardiac because sometimes people you know may feel like they're still a little shaky on it in your textbook chapter 17 is a chapter that is just focused on cardiac um, anatomy and physiology okay so that's one of the plain anatomy and physiology chapters chapter 17 I didn't write it here because it's not technically included but if you just want to look at that chapter and read it as a re review that's the chapter okay um, 16 what do you need to know? Everything. I don't even know what to say here. Okay. 16 was divided into basic anatomy and physiology of how the body regulates blood pressure. Then it went into the condition of hypertension. Okay. So that's how it was divided. You should know every single word in that PowerPoint. Okay. Um, we need to know how the body normally regulates blood pressure, short term, long term. I'm just throwing things out. Um, when it comes to blood pressure, we should understand systolic, diastolic, how, how we get to that point. Okay, so we should be able to explain how you get a systolic reading, how you get a diastolic reading. Okay, and that correlates to stroke volume and S and systemic vascular resistance. Um, cardiac output. We should know what that means and understand that concept. Uh, Short-term, long-term regulation. I also included some hypertensive medications that counteract those pathways. And when we get into the condition of hypertension, you definitely need to know everything there. Um, primary, secondary, risk factors, in-organ damage, hypertensive emergency, urgency, I, you know. Every single thing that's there you need to know, because I guarantee you're going to see a hypertensive situation. 
Okay. Um, speaking of 16, this also includes 16.2. So this was our blood pressure classification chart. So it is important to make sure uh, that we know what's considered normal uh, prehypertensive stage one and stage two, okay? These are the only numbers that I'm holding you guys responsible for for this term, okay? So you just memorize those numbers and you should be good to go. In the past, I used to have students memorize a whole bunch of numbers. Mm -hmm. Kind of debating if I should go back there. Which, um, not for you guys, but next term. Um, yeah, so anyway, as of right now, just hypertensive numbers, uh, hypertension, that's all you need to know. Okay, um, 18, this chapter was split into a category of understanding coronary syndromes, and then we also went into valvular disorders, and then we also went into infections of the heart. Okay, so it really was kind of divided into three components. Those are the three components, okay? So just to go into more detail with the first component of coronary syndromes, we went into a lot of detail here, okay? So we went into understanding atherosclerosis, how that leads to a coronary syndrome, and then also details of how that, or especially acute coronary syndromes, leading into a myocardial infarction. So we should be able to know all of that information and how we get there. We should also know special testing and labs that are included with this, okay? So we should know EKG, we should know cardiac markers, what their role is, okay? We should know even going back to atherosclerosis, what is the purpose of, of knowing the lipid panel, okay, and, and how that correlates to atherosclerosis. So we should be able to understand the whole process okay um, <clears throat> the next category was uh, valvular disorders so with valvular disorders I think we went over uh, six different types I believe so just make sure you go over all the different valvular disorders we should know the name what the issue is or the mechanism and also um, know what the potential outcome could be so sometimes it can lead a patient into a heart failure or you know, some kind of blockage or, or whatever the case may be. Okay. Just as a um, clarification, I will not test you on the sounds. Okay, so I know they have the description of the sounds there. I will not test you on the sounds. Okay. But just making sure you understand what is going on. And then the very last part of 18 focused on infections, and we only had three, one, three different types here. I didn't get into a whole lot of information. We had two bacterial, one viral, so we had um, infective endocarditis, um, rheumatic heart disease, and um, myocarditis. And just to confirm, okay, rheumatic heart disease came up again, yes, in chapter 51, okay, or 52, one of those chapters, okay, so remember, rheumatic heart disease came up again, okay, in two chapters. Okay, so that's that. 19, I, I believe I gave you guys very organized, detailed information with congestive heart failure, okay. So, number one, if you're still shaky on the normal anatomy in the flow of blood in and out of the heart, please start there first. Okay, if you're shaky, if you're still shaky on that. If you're not shaky on it, then you're fine. Um, but the reason why I'm saying that, because people that are still shaky with that information, they're still not quite understanding right and left and why the patient has edema and, and what's going on. Okay, so um, once you get past that, we should be able to understand the risk factors for congestive heart failure in general. 
because the risk factors are listed there. We should be able to understand what's happening with right and left, okay? And in particular, the symptoms that you should see with right and left sided heart failure. We also went into diagnostic testing of how they diagnose this. And, um, and also knowing that it can occur bilaterally. And then chapter 20 was shock. Everything was shock. I would say um, we should know, and, and let me just kind of help break down the categories. So number one, we should understand the definition of shock. I, I think sometimes people don't quite understand what it means. Um, what shock means is that this is a decrease in perfusion of blood. And once we have a decrease of perfusion of blood, this will actually affect what's going to happen to cells and tissues. So now you have tissue and cell death that's going to occur. And once we have tissue and cell death that's going to occur, this can lead to organ death, which is why shock is a life-threatening condition. Okay, and that's just to sum it up. Now, the PowerPoint also goes into more detail of that, okay, with the pathogenesis, so I would pay attention to that. I would, I would definitely take a look at that because it explains what's happening on the cell membrane, um, ions, and unstable, uh, what do you call it? Um, what do you call unstable ions? I just had a free radical. Free radicals, thank you. Free radicals, Understanding that we don't have oxygenated blood now, so now we're going the anaerobic route, okay? So patients are gonna build up with lactic acid. That's important to know, super, super important to know because your patients that will have shock, the way you do monitor them is actually looking at the lactic acid levels. Lactic acid levels will definitely elevate when patients undergo shock. So, um, you know, knowing the pathogenesis is very important. So we go into that in the PowerPoint. Now, once we get past that information, it goes into all the different types and the categories, which takes us to box 20.1, so we know the categories of shock, um, the examples under each category and all of that. So, um, just to, I can have a question on any type of shock. However, I do put a little more focus on hypovolemic, anaphylactic, um, septic for sure and possibly cardiogenic okay but however we should know the categories and what's happening So that took us to week, what was that, four, five, I don't know, we got one now. One, two, one, two, three. That was week three, okay. And then four was 22 and 23. Okay, so respiratory. Um, I know chapter 22 was a lot of information, um, but just to make you aware, it was only, the, it was only really three, four, topics that we focus on with chapter 22. So this is the order. We had um, asthma, acute bronchitis, chronic bronchitis, and emphysema. What you need to know, the categories of these conditions, uh, we should know about the etiology or risk factors. We should definitely know um, the pathogenesis, and I know the pathogenesis slides were long, but I want you guys to go through those slides and as you're making your study guides, just try to, you know, sum it up somehow, okay? Uh, just keep in mind that most of these conditions do include some inflammatory response and, you know, some sort of um, secretion that's going to cause obstruction of airflow, okay? So that's kind of the overall theme here. So. You know, if somehow you can sum that up, because I know, especially when it comes to asthma and the other COPD topics, the pathogenesis were like probably six slides long, okay? 
but just try to, you know, pull it together somehow. Um, we should also take a look at signs and symptoms. And in chapter 22, we also took a look at diagnostic testing, okay? Um, and we wanna take a look at this because the diagnostic testing can help as a possible hallmark, okay, to help her, you know, figure out what the topic is. As you guys know, I don't really give a lot of treatment questions, and so let me just make a comment about that. Um, I don't have treatment questions a lot, but if I do have a treatment question here or there, your treatment questions are gonna be extremely straightforward to where if the patient is lacking something, you give them that, okay? So um, I, I don't want to, and it, it was also um, brought up in a meeting that we don't wanna focus so much on treatment here. That's, that's not the purpose of patho. The purpose is making sure we understand the disease process. Um, all that treatment stuff you guys are gonna get in the next, how long is your program? Another year or two? Two years. In the next two years. Okay, you're gonna get it two years of managing your patients. So, but here we just wanna make sure we understand what is happening with them, okay? All right, so, um, <clears throat> what else? So again, with 22, if you know the hallmarks, and we had quite a bit with each one, okay, you should be fine, okay? So I think we all know like the blue bloaters and, you know, um, checking for um, allergy testing for asthma, you know, all things like that. Things like that are just things that stand out, okay? Eosinophils and all that. Okay, so um, what else? other respiratory conditions such as, um, and I'll go down the list, we had uh, fibrotic lung disease, also known as interstitial lung disease. So um, again, with these topics that I'm going over, just make sure you know the hallmarks and you should be good to go. Um, we had sarcoidosis. We also had um, hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And we also had occupational lung disease. Now, just to also clarify, there was a, a discrepancy with the video and the PowerPoint and what, you know, topics was here and there. So what I did was just kind of pull them all together. So we did have some additional topics, okay? So I just want to go over those. So we have ARDS, IRDS, and pneumothorax, okay? So those three will be added, okay? So I just want to confirm that. Pneumothorax had very clear-cut hallmarks, okay? Um, ARDS and IRDS, they do share a common theme where um, the surfactant is an issue here, okay? And so it just varies according from adults to children how that develops, okay? And so I think you should be fine with that. Um, I don't get into too much detail with the signs and symptoms of it, even though I did explain it in the video, but if you could just understand what's missing and you know why it's missing or what's happening, you should be fine. Okay. So that took us to the midterm. Okay, that sounds crazy. <laughs> so yes, all of that information was on the midterm. After the midterm, we now pick up uh, 27, 28, 29, okay, 31, 33. So that week was like kind of uh, jam-packed with a whole lot of information because we combined mm -hmm. renal and reproductive. Um, Reproductive topics, or should say chapters, were 27, 28, 29. So let me try to go over this and sum it up. Uh, 28, let me just start there. That focused on acute renal failure and chronic kidney disease. So we kind of had that, I don't want to say separate, but it is a separate chapter, okay? Just focus on renal failure and chronic kidney disease. Um, I did tell you in the video, in, in the reviews before, what to focus on here. So we know how to distinguish 
okay, the two. Um, what I do focus on a lot, and, and you guys know this, is the outcomes or what are the secondary conditions these patients can have. So if the kidneys are failing, we know it's going to throw off fluid electrolytes, it can throw off cardiac things, um, it can even lead to uh, blood pressure issues, obviously, okay, hypertension. If they didn't have it before, they'll probably end up, you know, with some sort of hypertensive situation. So we want to definitely know those types of things when it gets out of balance, okay. Um, 27 and 29, uh, these two chapters, just to kind of help you organize your material, you can take these two chapters and divide it into categories of like, and actually you can do this for 31 and 33 as well. You can divide it into acquired congenital infections, cancers, tumors. And I think if you divide it into those categories, it'll maybe make your studying a little easier, okay? So that way we can just memorize like, you know, take a half an hour to memorize all the cancers, you know, then the next hour focus on the infections, okay? So, you know, if you memorize it in categories like that, I think it's easier than just kind of going slide by slide, okay? Um, again, pay attention to hallmarks. Um, infections, I think, are super easy. It's just a matter of knowing the title, what the infection is, what body parts are being affected, and that's pretty much it. Um, most of the infections are bacterial infections that we focused on, so you know, treatment is antibiotics. Um, the acquired disorders, you want to pay attention to what the patient is lacking or what, or what the possible risk factor is that led them to it. Okay. Um, with congenital disorders, we do want to focus on what the patient is lacking. So, what is it that they're um, the issue that they're not? They're, I can't get it out. They're born with a lack of something, okay, or something missing, okay, that they're born with. And um, cancers and tumors, that's kind of self-explanatory, so just that just goes in that area. And um, I think that was about it. For 33, for female reproductive disorders, you can also add in a category for pregnancy-related disorders and menstrual disorders if you want to put that separately, okay. Um, and that's, that's basically, I'm just trying to put it in categories for you. Um, however, we do want to pay attention to nephrolithiasis. We do want to pay attention to urolithiasis. We do want to pay attention to... Um, cystitis, urethritis, so any kind of lower urinary tract. And we do also want to understand upper urinary tract infections like polyonephritis, acute and chronic. Um, those things you should definitely pay attention to. Not only will I test you, possibly test you on those, but the chances of you seeing UTIs are very common. Okay, so we should know everything about UTIs as also kidney stones. Um, we should also know about incontinence because that's also quite common, as well as enuresis. Um, out of the information in 27 and 28 that I don't focus on, that I, I think I told you guys this before, I'm not going to get into the anomalies, like if someone's born with a missing kidney or a missing ureter or something like that. It's really not much to say, okay, about that. Um, if it's missing, most likely the body will adapt to it. If the body doesn't adapt, then they go for surgery or whatever it needs to be done. So it's not really much to say. Um, but everything else you should definitely pay attention to, okay? But that will eliminate some of your study time. You don't have to study that information, okay? Um, 36. We had a lot here with GI. So the first... I don't even want to know how many slides. I can't remember how many slides. The first, I don't know, 20 or whatever slides. Focus on GI signs and symptoms. Okay, so like dysphagia, when they're having like heartburn and you know, diarrhea, constipate, whatever was going on. So it just kind of went into detail with what's happening with those signs and symptoms. I would understand the physiology of it, yes. Okay, now whether I have a direct question with it or not, you should understand why it's happening. Okay, 
because it'll help you in the future. The rest of 36 went into all the different conditions. So the best way that I would organize my notes, if I were you, is to break it down from organ to organ. Okay, so disorders of the mouth, disorders of the esophagus, disorders of the stomach, small intestines, large intestines. Okay, and then that way you can just plug in. And I think it, um, and I'm just even going back to when I was in school memorizing things. Um, it, it's easier to take it piece by piece instead of feeling like, oh my God, I have to memorize 99 slides. Okay, so just take it piece by piece if you go over each organ okay and, and go over the topics for that organ then I you know it'll be much easier to digest that way okay 37 just really focused on um, gallbladder disorders and pancreatic disorders so we went into this understanding cholelithiasis and cholecystitis um, I guarantee you there's going to be questions with that so please make sure you understand uh, what they are and what's happening Oh. oh, yeah, we need to hurry up. Okay, and then, um, yes, pancreatic disorders. We had acute and chronic, I believe it was broken down into that. But we're really, with pancreatic disorders, um, just make sure you know the risk factors and, um, you know, what's happening and what are some possible complications that it can lead to. Forty-one was diabetes mellitus, and with this chapter, um, I made a mistake and gave you guys a shortened version, which I meant to give you the longer version. But anyway, um, we should know definitely the difference between when a patient has um, uh, type one and type two. Definitely should know the difference between that. We should know gestational diabetes mimics type 2, okay, and, um, and I think that was about it. But in, in the video, I did go into detail with breaking down what's considered type 2 diabetes, everything about that, possible risk factors, what are we looking for, non-ketotic hyperasmolarity, um, you know, it definitely affects multiple organ systems and, and all of that. Um, just like type 1. Type 1 has the ketoacidosis, okay, um, beta cell destruction, okay, so we, we know the difference between the two, okay, so we should be able to compare and contrast that, and get that, that should help you with your test questions. 44, acute brain disorders, just to kind of quickly go down the list, we only had a few things here. You should know how to compare and contrast ischemic stroke versus hemorrhagic. Okay, we had a test question with that and it may come up again for sure. We should definitely know how to compare and contrast the two. We should also know cerebral aneurysms. We should also know meningitis, cerebral abscess, and encephalitis. So those I do focus on. 51. At everything. So 51 is another chapter that we can actually maybe break it down into categories so it doesn't feel overwhelming. So you can break it down into a category of cancers. I would definitely break, have a category for trauma because we did have a lot of topics on trauma such as fractures. Um, we talked about ligamentous and cartilaginous injuries. Um, and then you can also have a separate category for I don't know if you want to call it metabolic disorders. I don't know if that'll be the right topic, but disorders in a sense where patients are lacking vitamin D or, um, you know, osteoporosis and, you know, kind of, you know, uh, you get the idea. The topic for those conditions, okay. Um, what else? And then 52 were just on arthritic conditions. As I told you before, please make sure you know every single thing about osteoarthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis as well. You should know everything about that. And in particular, you should be able to compare and contrast osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis. I guarantee you there will be test questions with it in the sense where it may 
have some items of RA, some items of osteoarthritis. So you should be able to easily compare and contrast the two. And then everything else just kind of focused on primary conditions that now lead to secondary arthritic changes. And so that should be easy enough to handle. Um, but I will put a little more emphasis on gout, okay, because gout is one of those conditions that we do need to know what's happening, what is in excess, what are the body parts that are being affected, and you know, because gout is a little more complicated, okay. Okay, that was a rundown. <laughs> So as you see, I wasn't able to go into each and every topic, but uh, you know, just to kind of give you a sense as to how to organize your material. Okay, so now I'm going to turn this off, and that ends the review. Okay. Um,